Mountain Blade is a game about putting archers on a hill and then admiring one's tactical genius. Then you can follow Sun Tzu's tactics and use F1 and F3 to charge directly into the enemy. In the ensuing charge, you can expect to dome an enemy lord with an arrow right to the brain, and then he'll still manage to find a way to escape. Warband was an expansion to the original 2008 Mountain Blade, and it's a type of game that is remarkably rare. It officially doesn't have a genre name outside of action role-playing game, but that's one of the least descriptive things ever written. This commenter called them RPG 4Xs, and you know what? I like that. The games in this genre are Mountain Blade and Star Sector. And honestly, probably Stalker Anomaly too. The core tenets of this genre are how while you start from nothing, through trade, contracts, recruitment, war profiteering, and bounty hunting, you can grow to become the leader of an empire. Banner Lord was Warband's sequel, and it was announced a full 8 years before its early access release in 2020. For some context as to how long ago that was, 2012, the year of the announcement, was the same year Minecraft classic Fallen Kingdom was released, and it took until Covid hit to be fully released to the public. Upon its release to the public, it was received with a great... meh. Despite the ridiculously long development time, Bannerlord's first release was absolutely plagued with a locust swarm of bugs. CJI was the most infamous, but my personal favorite was half of the perks doing literally nothing at release. That being said, I'm not really interested in why Bannerlord turned out the way it is, but instead focus on how it's worse than the other versions of the same formula, specifically Warband and its modding scene. The differences in games starts early as character creation. In Warband, you get this kind of ugly over-choice overload, whereas in Bannerlord, you get a very sleek and trimmed character creator. Bannerlord, true as name, has this really in-depth banner creation tool and then doesn't let you use it, which is really bizarre. You can still use a community-created mod to paste in really long text strings to use custom banners, but the default ones you can make are significantly less complex than any banner in Warband. The very first choice you make in Bannerlord's character customization, and the last one in Warband, is where your character is from. In Warband, wherever you choose is where you start the game, but in Bannerlord, you always appear in this Empire training ground for some reason. It's also the only training ground in the game, and you can't train troops in it unlike Warband for no well-explained reason. After that, the standard Mountain Blade gameplay remains intact, and relative to native Warband, I would say that the experience of recruitment, questing, combat, party management, and market interactions are all a major improvement. NPCs can be interacted with with barely any loading screen, combat feels a lot more fluid, and the animation work is quite stellar, and all of the market is on one screen rather than four sub-shops. But even with all these improvements, I still found myself significantly more compelled to a mod for Warband than Bannerlord. Prophecy of Pandor. It's a total conversion for Warband that gets rid of Calradia completely and replaces it with the titular Pandor. Every faction's culture has differing troop trees that affect what units you recruit in their borders will grow up to become when they get older. In Pandor, they have tentative ties to the ones of Warband's Calradia. Going by color, the Nords in the north have been replaced with the Kingdom of Ravenstern, and while they both have very similar vibes, Ravenstern are a lot more archer focused than the Nords' infantry strength. The Feared's Vein, on the other hand, do take up the axe, and even have Harskarls. Color-wise, they replace the Rodox, and do even have crossbowmen. Right in the middle, the Kingdom of Sarleon quite obviously replaces native Swadia, even down to their cavalry strength. Then there's the Bacchus Empire down in the southeast, which is pretty unique and doesn't really have any ties to Warband's factions, but is obviously taking a lot from my beloved Romans. That shouldn't be a surprise, I did change my name to this, after all. Then, down in the southern desert lies the Dashar Principalities, who are a mix of Warband's Kurjit Sultanate and Serenid Khanate. There is one more kind of major faction in Pendor, though? The Noldor. They don't take and hold territory like any other faction, though it would be awesome if they did, but they hide in secret in the mountains as the most dangerous faction in the entire world. They're part of a set of minor factions which aren't really proper factions but rather roaming armies. The ones who are always hostile, and thus the only ones you care about, are the Heretics, the Snake Cult, and the Jatu. The other reason you care about these three is that you'll be farming them pretty extensively later on. After you beat their leaders, you can let them go in exchange for a Qualis gem, which are an exceptionally rare resource that's exchanged for endgame gear and troops. Some of these endgame troops are Noldor. They're a set of elves who live in the forest. I know, a very unique concept. And they're easily the best in the game. 
there's something that's really missing from Bannerlord in my opinion. And no, I don't mean that Bannerlord needs to have magic elves, but rather a faction you can only ever get an extremely limited number of troops from who are by far and large better than everyone else. Apart from a few easter egg locations, those Qualis gems are so exceptionally rare that even an endgame army that has conquered half of Pendor is likely to only have, like, maybe a dozen Noldor troops. Every single one is very treasured just because of how good they are, and any time you see them in the casualty report, Port, it's pretty heart-wrenching, and the relief you feel after you realize they were just wounded is pretty palpable too. Being able to hire limited qualities of overseas mercenaries in Bannerlord would serve about the same role. Exceptionally rare resources like Qualis gems are rare to see in games like these, and they should really be around more. Having an endgame time sync is really good and sadly missing from Bannerlord. I don't think it's an unreasonable ask either. The devs had 8 years to look at community created content for Warband and expand on their ideas instead of just making a more polished version of Native. That's actually a pretty big problem with Bannerlord in general. It's a good game, but it's basically just Warband if it was made a decade later. If you want a mechanic as basic as a stamina a system, you'll have to turn to mods for that. The Realistic Combat Overhaul mod does implement this, and it looks super funny, as well as being very fun to play around. I know I said I wasn't going to comment on Bannerlord's development, but I have to briefly. It's been, uh, pretty rough for modders, and it still hasn't improved that much. Last year, a bunch of mod teams put together a pretty big letter calling Tail Worlds out on issues with the underlying code, and it looks like giant overhaul mods for Bannerlord are still years out. A port of Pendor might straight up never happen. The game we have now is also filled with a bunch of questionable design decisions. Bannerlord does seem geared towards the player grinding even more, which is something that was already pretty atrocious in Warband. Tournaments are your main way of making money in Warband, and they net somewhere around 4,000 per tournament, which has been dropped by half in Bannerlord. In Pendor, they give you 20,000. Bannerlord does give you an item as pittance in these, but they're usually worth very little relatively. The reason Pendor gives you so much per tournament is that it understands grinding tournaments for money, or grinding money at all, is the exact opposite of fun, and so it doesn't waste your time by forcing you to do it a shitload, until very late game. And even then it's optional. Bannerlord also makes training your troops kind of insufferable. In Warband, you just sort of open up your skills, click the plus next to trainer a bunch, and boom. Your troops will gradually gain XP every day, and you're good. If you really need to raise units in a hurry, you can go to one of the half dozen training fields to get that done pretty fast. As previously mentioned, those don't exist in Bannerlord. Neither does the trainer skill. There are a few perks which passively give your troops XP, but they're nowhere near the level that the old trainer skill did, and it just contributes to making the game feel more like a grind fest. There's some stuff that I think was wholly needlessly changed just to be different. Warband's combat log is exceedingly simple. If you see blue, it means enemies are dying. If you see orange, it means one of your troops will be knocked out for a bit. If you see red, it means that they're dead. In short, blue good, orange acceptable, red bad. In Bannerlord, that extra element of being able to teleport Nox from deaths is almost entirely gone. Instead, both read as red in the kill feed, but this icon is different. This is nearly impossible to read at a glance. In Warband, you can just scan the kill feed for red deaths to note losses on the fly, but I can't read this. Why on earth was this changed? Was implementing the color orange too far out of the budget you've had subsidized by the Turkish government for eight years? All the games that I've talked about here, Mountain Blade, Star Sector, and especially Stalker, also have something pretty important in common. Do you remember how Tynan keeps trying to sell RimWorld as a story generator? These games are similar. They're so incredibly dynamic and systems-based that while I can dryly talk about their mechanics, ultimately they're set up in such a way that allows for the player to go and have their own completely unique experience. Unlike, I don't know, Call of Duty, they're not linear experiences where you go from one set piece to another. These games are certainly far more than the sum of their parts. They're built to foster the creation of individual stories that are unique to every player, giving them a really interesting water cooler appeal. To give you the perfect example of what I'm talking about, I could tell you about how Stalker is kind of dry with dated visuals and half thrown together mechanics built on a shoestring budget, or I could recount to you the tale of Master Sergeant Kuntsev, who single-handedly held off a monolith expeditionary force headed straight for Freedom's HQ, until both they and their PC exploded. Perhaps another time. For now, please, let me leave you with this clip.